This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, I think time to begin. I may welcome to the historical research and the fourth of our six public seminars which we're calling History Now and Then. Each month we're inviting a panel of distinguished historians to talk about some of the major issues raised by the way we regard or disregard the past. And I recognize many familiar faces, many of you have been to previous sessions. Welcome back and welcome to those of you who are here for the first time. Some of what we say might be amplified later on, some of it won't. So I thought if I try to start by not being amplified but talking loud, is this audible in this strange room of ours? If it isn't, at any point, just join in, you're part of the show as well. Um, those of you who've been here in the past will know that we've usually been introduced by the director of the Institute, Lawrence Goldman, Professor Goldman. He's been called away and is in fact lecturing tonight in the Isle of Wight. Um, Since his regards, I saw him yesterday and he would love to be here and would indeed be at the next one a month from now, but sadly not here tonight. <clears throat> Last month we talked about the mythologizations of the past. We had sessions on heritage and the past, various ways in which history becomes controversial. And tonight's topic follows very much on what we've had in previous sessions, and it deals with the nature of the, 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 the truth that all historians presumably aspire to discover and to write about. We historians, we don't mythologize the past, we don't go in for myth, we go in for the facts we research them and we write them down and they are there indisputably for all time, presumably. And yet, I was thinking back to when I first learnt history and I learnt about the Tudors from A.L. Rouse or Geoffrey Elton. Um, <clears throat> I remember learning about wider European history from H.A.L. Fisher or the most recent books by H.A.P. Taylor, a name that may well crop up later on this evening. Uh, medievalism from uh, um, Eileen Power and others, whose captain was telling me about Lincoln and the American Civil War, and so on. All of these, Trebellium, um, Tawny, they're all historians I still greatly admire, but they've, they've kind of slipped down the list of required women. <coughs> they are passe in many ways, except among the professionals who want to know about earlier historians and historiography. <clears throat> Why does each generation feel the need to rewrite the history that its predecessors were writing? What's changed? You think the facts don't change? Well, <clears throat> there are new facts. There might be new data, new sources that come up, uh, you know, um, Goebbels' diary or whatever it might be, that wasn't known to previous generations of historians. Perspectives shift. We're less concerned nowadays, perhaps, and I'm simplifying, with the history of generals and kings and archbishops, and perhaps more with the ordinary experience of ordinary people, you know, health, life, sex, um, ethnicity, gender, cultural history, because our perspectives have changed. We perhaps <coughs> all see the past through various um, national prisms. So the, I was reading the Japanese have been rewriting their history, particularly that of World War II. Um, the Russians, I gather, are reviving Stalin and the Great Patriotic War a bit. The Israelis, the Australians, the Canadians, Many people are having disputes about their own past, as we have in this country over what we heard a couple of sessions ago about uh, imperial history, for example. 
So the question really tonight is this. <clears throat> we all look for, I suppose, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Think we found it. And then blow me down if the next generation doesn't show that there's a completely new way of looking at the facts that we thought we had. <clears throat> Let me introduce tonight's panel. And what I'm going to do in a few minutes is ask each of them to talk for about 10 minutes or so, kind of introduction to their perspective on the subject. And then by seven-ish, will, they will have finished. And we will call upon you for questions and discussion for half an hour or so. And then by half past seven, we'll break. There are plenty of drinks over there. Come and have a drink. Come and chat to us all. Um, and uh, half an hour, 40 minutes after that, we'll probably have had enough. We will want another drink and some food, and I'm going to whisk them off to eat something just down the road. Let me say a word or two about our four distinguished panel members tonight. And as always, so as to avoid offence, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. It just so happened that Penelope Caulfield is being received at the far end. I've only known Penny for 25 or 30 years, something like that. When I first got to know her, I, I remember labelling her as a kind of 18th centuryist. And in some ways, it's probably accurate. She's one of the conveners of the IHR seminar on the long 18th century held in this uh, very institute. She was uh, already, when I first knew her at Royal Holloway, where I think we're now emeritus professor, written extensively on life in the 18th century England, work life, electoral, political behavior, and so on. Um, but she's also written on much broader issues of historiography or historiology, a term we may find <coughs> many using later on. And uh, has also written very interestingly on time, <coughs> time and the shape of history and the changing shape of history. Felipe Fernández Armesto, next to me here, yes, Felipe has a Spanish name and Spanish lineage, and he's written on Columbus, the Armada, and the Americas North and South. <coughs> but he would think that I'm labeling him far too narrowly. Felipe is a globalist, if ever there was. Um, he's written books on truth, on food, when we were in the run-up to the new millennium, you wrote a book called Millennium. You've written Civilizations, and another on the, the brief history of humankind. He does the whole planet from then <coughs> to now. And most interesting, very recently, has written a short book, which I've been reading, um, about how and why cultures change from place and time, but in a non- Darwinian evolutionary way, if I can try and sum up for what you've done. So Felipe will be the second to speak. Ian Kershaw, Sir Ian Kershaw. You all know Ian, I think, the outstanding one, the great outstanding historians of Nazism and the author of, I would think, the authoritative two-volume biography of Hitler. Um, Interestingly, Ian didn't begin as a 20th centuryist or even a Germanist. He began as a medievalist, uh, Ian, and in fact, when you first went to Germany, uh, you weren't writing biographies, you weren't writing about um, Hitler, you were writing a kind of popular perspectives of Nazism, opposition to it, what it <coughs> seemed like to those on the ground, as it were. So you might, <coughs> in a sense, seem not to have been <coughs> Uh, predisposed to be a, a biographer, which makes, I think, frankly, the, the Hitler biography all the more impressive because it sees Hitler in all the broadest perspectives, including the psychological questions that have been asked about how far was he the decision maker, uh, and so on. And most recently, Ian, you've been writing a two-volume history of Europe in the 20th century for Anna Ney, Penguin. Volume one, which takes us up to what, 1945, right. no, is, <laughs> is published. Got to get your facts right. <laughs> and you're well into the second volume. Jonathan Steinberg, uh, what well, I was going to say crudely, you know, from Hitler back to Bismarck, but that's something we may or may not discuss later on. Jonathan's uh, recent magnum opus, many of us will have heard him lecturing about it in this very room. 
is an outstanding biography of Bismarck. Jonathan spent much of his working life uh, at Cambridge and uh, also particularly recently University of Pennsylvania. The uh, biography of the Iron Chancellor is universally lauded as the finest biography there is, uh, including by Henry Kissinger, who hailed it as the best study of its subject in the English language, and of course has gone into many other languages since. But Jonathan's not just a Germanist, he's also very crossing boundaries of various kinds, as all the panelists today are. Um, he's a true Europeanist, he's a transatlanticist, he's written on Swiss history, on why fascist history did not help its German allies during the Holocaust, and many other subjects as well. Deutsch Bank, quite a variety of different topics of great interest. So, enough from me, let's hear from the panel. <coughs> as I say, we'll, um, they'll each talk for about 10 minutes, it's just past 10 past 6 now, and we'll wrap up this section of the seminar at something like seven, and then it's over to you to question the panelists. And I'm told that we may by then have a roving microphone that actually, as opposed to the one I've got here, really amplifies the sound. So listen carefully and be prepared to ask some interesting questions of, I think, an outstanding panel. Penny Corfield, let me call upon you first. Everyone, good evening. What a pleasure to be here. And again, wave from the back if you can't hear me, but I usually manage to <coughs> project. And I'm delighted the word historiology has first come up. It's the study of the theories and ideas that make history work as a discipline. And put this on just, just as a, as a Can I be heard? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. It's, always, it's always good in me. Actually, it's being recorded as well, so it might as well be really loud. And I want to finish my third point will be to introduce a new word, which I've coined especially for you. So the first point is to do with rewriting the past. Why, oh why, can't historians just agree with each other? So students wail when presented with ever longer reading lists. The implication is that we are writing too many books and have generated consumer fatigue. And just think how old a complaint this is. In 1781, think of this response. Another damn thick book, eh? <laughs> scribble, 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 Mr. Gibbon. <laughs> and that was said to him, given by uh, the Duke of Gloucester, the brother of George III. And of course, the irony of such an exchange is that this is the one thing for which the Duke of Gloucester is famous. <laughs> So, despite these cries, historians persist in writing. And the short answer, of course, is that we can't stop the writing of history because our subject, what we're talking about, is always changing. So the subject is always changing to keep up to date. Uh, and so writing is always changing to keep up to date with a changing subject. Again, quick footnote, I don't suppose we're going to spend a lot of time today defining history, but here, I am talking about the study of the human past broadly since the advent of literacy, since that's broadly what historians do, although in fact I'm debating with pre-historians of why the period of should actually be pre-history when it's really part of history, but never mind, I'm talking broadly about the history of the human past, though of course, do let's acknowledge a very big development in the subject is the advent of big history, which may go back to the origins of Earth, or indeed the origins of the cosmos. But the same principles really apply, but these long-term perspectives are always being, re being rewritten. 
So the context keeps changing to pick up some of the points which I'm sure are going to be developed by the rest of the panel. There are new sources, either discovered or of course created. We also create sources through databases and so forth, or new ways of using old sources, certainly new methodologies, new technologies, new questions, certainly new approaches. As already mentioned, you know, there's much more now about sex than there is about battles, these different sorts of battles, you know. And new researchers, each generation, and new perspectives on the unfolding of history through time. So the one example I thought I would give you is uh, one from the 18th century, but if Scotland leaves the UK constitutionally, then our interpretations of the 1707 Act of Union will certainly change. It will no longer be thought of as a brilliant compromise which produced longevity and permanence, but instead a political expedient which had an only limited shelf life of just over 300 years. Okay, that's quite a long time, but it's not a very long time in the very long term. So changing events do actually change historical perspectives. And I don't mean we'll revise the date of the, of the 1707 Act of Union, not just the dates, but the meaning. So it's a moving discipline because we're studying a new, moving subject with moving resources and moving researchers. So that's one point. The second is, I think, something I really would like to stress. The rewriting is not a source of reproach. Oh, why can't historians make up their minds? but rather one of celebration. It's a discipline that's constantly renewing itself. The implication is somehow that rewriting means discarding all the old stuff. And indeed, sometimes earlier experts are proved entirely wrong. Rare people are wrong absolutely everything. In most cases, new building, new writing, builds upon the old, even if from different perspectives. And after all, even the most determinedly revisionist historians, which occur in every period and especially on every controversial subject, the revisionists don't throw out, for example, the date of the Act of Union. You know, they're, they're building on certain established things. So historians, when writing something, rarely discard everything and start afresh. I mean, I myself try and choose to change the language I use, say, for periodization. But actually, it's very difficult to do that consistently. You keep finding old language keeps creeping in. So we're deeply immersed in a discipline that is always changing. So old works can be starting points for new. They can lie fallow for many years and then be revived or re-examined afresh. Or they can indeed be forgotten, but they contribute to the discussion in their own time and they may have influenced the total debate in their own day, even if you know, their names, the names of previous historians, are not absolutely at the forefront of everyone's mind, but they've helped to create a general picture. And that's, of course, why we have libraries, and now Google libraries. So the effect, really, of these earlier studies is to create a scaffolding of knowledge on which the next generation Bills. And of course, part of the building may be pulling down a wing or re erecting or changing this or that. But we don't start absolutely afresh. Carl now, who was on the throne in the 17th century, ah, oh, it's the Stuarts. You know, we don't start by reinventing <coughs> everything. And by the way, I thought I'd say a scaffolding for knowledge, because that does imply a creative developing picture. Another good view would be a seed bed. But a seed bed, you know, it's a little bit more like back to the ground each time, whereas in fact, we build often imperceptibly on the works of earlier generations. So, and it's not only early generations of historians, but also from all those who helped to collect, <coughs> preserve, and curate evidence from the past. So we're building on historians, but also, you know, obviously, you know, run through the whole gamut, archivists, librarians, museum curators, art galleries, heritage associations, antiquarian societies, and of course today, uh, those who are digitizing historical resources, extending them to new uh, medium and audiences. So all those who are generating the material, you know, not all that necessarily <coughs> make, but an enormous scaffolding for the use of later generations. Again, just 
and take one example. Collectively, over two generations since World War II, historians, broadly historians, some non-specialists as well, but broadly together, historians through their collective efforts, including heated arguments and polemics, I don't want to suggest it's all a, a simple and happy process, but collectively it's taken two generations work to establish tolerably reliable figures. And don't say any more than tolerably reliable for the extent of the state-directed murders during the Holocaust. And similar endeavors ha have happened and are still happening to get accurate figures for mortality, and this is often a source of great controversy, but mortality levels in wars, in civil wars, through political purges, or as the results of epidemics. And Historians collectively are debating this, and I say, often arguing quite angrily with each other too, but collectively building up a picture, and often with the very useful side effect of refuting rumors, legends, and propaganda claims is one great thing that history can do. So I do say, in terms of knowledge, that's progress. Of course, that just explain. I don't mean wars and purges and all the rest of those purges. No, no, no. So I'm not saying all of history progresses. There are all sorts of examples to the contrary. But I certainly think the writing and study of history progresses between and over the generations. So my third and last point before the chair stops me. Historians are in constant dialogue with historians from earlier eras, whether to demolish, correct, or augment. It can't be done in a, vac in a vacuum. But we can't really just call it a dialogue. The previous generations can't answer back. We can criticize them, they can't criticize us. They can't even revise their work in the light of our criticisms, or no doubt they might. So my new word is we're engaged in a plurilogue. Not a dialogue or a monologue, but a plurilogue. I'm proud of this invention, which I've devised for today, and I've just put up on my blog. It refers to multi-way communication through both space and that's especially because of the international debates among historians, how that has developed during my lifetime as a historian, but also through time. And then, really annoyingly, I decided to Google this word, and blow me, since 2011, there has been a new online interdisciplinary journal with the name Plurilog. <laughs> <laughs> now, how annoying is that? It takes reviews in philosophy and political science. I felt extremely annoyed, but then I thought I should look at it another way. Plural is obviously a word whose time has come. <laughs> and its near simultaneous coinage is a sign of plural in action. So my final point, historians continually rewrite the past because they are in a continuing plural with past historians as future generations will be with us. Well, it's a, a great privilege to be engaged in a plurilogue with Penny and, <laughs> and, and Ian and Thompson and Dan, and with all of you as I look at the audience, I see many people whom I um, admire and whom I find intimidating. Uh, it's a great, great treat. Uh, thank you very much, Dan, for having me. Well, I have three answers to the question before us. The first lies in the nature of the profession. Because the historical profession is full of tiresome professors who will not appoint young historians to posts unless they are guaranteed psychophantic adherence to orthodoxy. <laughs> there is something, you know, I sclerotic and stuntified that's inherent in the way the historical profession is organized. But on the other hand, those young historians, when they come into their own, are obliged to disagree with their predecessors, otherwise they'd be out of a job. An economically, the historical profession is committed to a, a continual plurilog. Uh, a second reason is that it lies in the, the, the nature 
of the discipline. I, I abhor and repudiate everything Dan said about the obligation of the historian to establish the truth, except, of course, it is the obligation of the historian to establish the truth about the sources. But beyond that, interpretation is infinitely elastic because the past is not present to our senses. And you know, the only escape we have is endlessly to reinterpret the evidence. And I don't say that for some ghastly post modern reason. I believe, you know, the truth is out there, but I don't think that we're going to be able to grasp it by uh, um, uh, studying uh, uh, history. We, we, all we're going to be able to, to establish is uh, facts about the sources. We're not going to be able to establish any definitive facts about what those sources may be able to tell us about the past. And I, I Relish that. I mean, I wallow in these uncertainties because I, you know, I, there's a terrible uh, he heresy which you find in educational circles that history is a, a, a factual discipline. It's not. It's a problematic discipline. The purpose of which is to identify and explore fascinating and I hope to God unanswerable <coughs> questions about the past. Uh, because to me, you know, I mean, if I ever find the answer to a question, I get terribly depressed. You know, it's like the plot at the end of a lollipop. You know, the definitive solutions has closed down. Debate, which is what we relish and what we're engaged in, that's why I chose this Discipline amongst all the others that interest me, and partly because history encompasses everything else, because it is the totality. I would say not any just the human experience, but the experience of all cultural creatures. I say it has that virtue, but the greatest virtue of history for me is its open-endedness and its susceptibility uh, to infinite <coughs> discussion. If I were interested in Disciplines that were dedicated to solving problems, I do something boring like you know, engineering or medicine or something like that. And the third reason, the third explanation for the problem before us this evening lies in the nature of the subject. I agree with Penny about that, because historians, like everybody else, we are implicated in what we do, and we can't separate ourselves from the cultural context in which we are studying the past. And because that context is always changing, our construction of what we see in the evidence changes with it. And I'm just going to spend the rest of my time showing you if I can, in the unlikely event that I can operate the technology, uh, I'm just going to show you some images to illustrate that. First of all, a very famous painting here by Vermeer, which uh, yeah, art critics conventionally call the allegory of painting. It's a really stupid name because it's obviously not an allegory of painting. It's obviously an allegory of history. In the foreground and the middle ground, you can see Vermeer's rather idiosyncratic self-portrait because the self-portrait is back. But I don't think he's turned his back on us in order to exclude us. I mean, I think this is a sort of gesture the priests used to make in celebrating the old-fashioned mass in which they're inviting us to accompany them in the contemplation of a mystery before their eyes. And obviously, Vermeer is directing our attention to the model he's painting, uh, who represents Clio, the muse of history. And you can tell that, of course, because she's, she's holding the carrion of fame in one hand, the book, in the other standard iconographic clues to her uh, identity. And yet, uh, she's a rather odd kind of goddess. Uh, because she, well, she's sumptuously attired, she kind of looks rather, I don't know, rather depressed and sad. Uh, and her carrion is almost sort of falling from her feeble grasp of her book is closed as though history were over and there were nothing more to say. 
Um, but the reason why she is so depressed, I think, is becomes clear when we look at the background of the painting, which, of course, is a, a map of the Netherlands. But it's a map of the Netherlands as they had been unified before the Peace of Münster, of which was 1650, just before uh, probably Vermeer painted this painting, when it almost certainly early in the 1650s. Uh, so he's, we're, we're looking back, we're being invited to look back to a time when the Netherlands were one country, uh, a Catholic country, uh, to a nostalgic <coughs> period of godliness and unity, which meant so much to Vermeer, who was a Catholic who history washed up on the wrong side of the division of the, the Netherlands into the uh, Protestant and Catholic ruled moieties. Every focus for a moment on the, the chandelier, which I want to almost say it really crowns the whole composition because it ha has a kind of crown-like form. And the lights are extinguished just as Clio's book is closed. So the past that we're invited to look back on here is a, a subject of nostalgia and regret. And of course, just as the chandelier crowns the composition, the chandelier itself is crowned by the double-headed eagle of the Habsburgs, the dynasty who had ruled uh, the Netherlands when it was united and Catholic. So for Vermeer, Clio, for Vermeer, history is a deeply personal and, and, and particular um, episode. Please zoom ahead, 120 years or so. I are in the Enlightenment now looking at a, a representation of the same goddess by Francois Boucher, Madame de Pompadour's favorite painter, who early in his career had been a pornographer, and literally that was his job, illustrating erotic books, and as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, he carried into the respectable phase of his career some of the skills that he had developed uh, at that earlier phase. But here we've got a completely different understanding of history, because Clio has left the confines of the earth and the studio, and she's ascended to the Empyrean, where she can really behold the whole universe in a single gaze. And she's accompanied now, not only by her trumpet, trumpet of fame, but by a lyre, which I think is an allusion to Aristotle's doctrine, that poetry, symbolized by the lyre, is a superior art to that of the historian, because whereas historians deal in boring particulars, poetry deals in universal truth. So we're in a, now in a, a conception of history which reflects enlightenment notions about philosophic history, about the universality of the subject. Sorry, have, have I run out of time already? Oh, well, in that case, we'll need to zoom through. Uh, you know, uh, history is understood in nationalist circles, in uh, Empire, Henri, uh, when, when we're going to have to skip the period in which Clio has all her traditional features, except her face, <laughs> in Kiriko's painting, because this is done in a period of fascism and communism, when impersonal forces dominated people's conception of history and individuality was obliterated. We're going to have to miss out the postmodern Clio painted by Rosa Maria uh, Trockel, and end with the this final uh, image, I'm afraid the, the computer is collaborating with the chairman. Uh, this is the latest <laughs> image I wanted to show you of the client, which has become black and is looking at the world through uh, an African lens, indeed looking through the Rift Valley where um, uh, uh, humankind originated. And so, I mean, this is a, an image of history as understood in a post-colonial and globalizing world. We're never going to be able to escape the influence of those changing circumstances. They're changing faster than ever now because the pace of cultural change is accelerating. And uh, why that is, I've explained in the book to which uh, 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 Dan kindly um, alluded. Uh, but if I stop now, it's not in to enhance my prospects of royalties. Uh, it's uh, it, 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 in order to save my, my reputation as a channel. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I was plenty to ask Philippe about later on, I know. Uh, Ian, over to you. Well, lovely to be here and to be able to uh, contribute to this discussion. Uh, <laughs> Otherwise, we're meant to be professionals here. <laughs> No. Yes. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, well, I think that was um, that was history as intellectual theatrical performance, and I don't know if it was too. Uh, but the, um, uh, let me bring us back to something that's uh, much more mundane. And in, in what I've got to say, I do um, already have to admit that I'll be overlapping, of course, greatly in many ways with what Penny and what Felipe have said, how is it possible not to do so in, in the fundamentals of this. The topic is rewriting the past, and the subtitle is interesting, the need in each generation to reconfigure the past. So I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. But, uh, it, this notion of the connection of the present and the past is, is uh, even older than history as a professional discipline. Uh, Friedrich Schiller, the great German um, poet and playwright, and philosopher as well, um, was already writing in the late uh, 18th century, and he said, uh, why do we study history? He was a, he was a historian too at this time. Why do we study history? From the sum total of facts, the, the historian selects those which have had significant influence on today's world and the condition of the current generation. So this is Schiller writing uh, long before any of us were studying history professionally. And then, of course, everybody knows uh, Benedetto Croce uh, writing much later in the first half of the 20th century, so all history is contemporary history. Uh, by which I think you can see that phrase, that famous phrase, all history is contemporary history, in two ways. Uh, one is that um, the relationship of, of history to today, as Schiller was imagining, that somehow all history has some something to do with the present time, but also the other way around, much more obviously, that uh, the past is viewed always through the prism of the, of the present. Uh, and so we see, as many examples have already pointed out, we see the impact of, uh, of today in the writing of history. So um, I think we, we have to accept that history is uh, a creative art form. It, it's maybe a low-level art form, but it's a creative art form. Uh, usually, when I was a student, there was a d debate that I could never very much understand, even at that time, about whether history was a science or an art. And, um, of course, there is the time where we have political sciences and we've had uh, social sciences and people want to call it historical sciences. But it seemed to me always that history was an art form, which is why, then, of course, we write history in different ways. It's not the best obvious, not that the facts change, but we interpret it in different ways, and everybody who's written or attempted to write a history book knows how much of an art form goes into the production of that book, how you structure it, how you write the chapters, how you frame it, and so on, leaving aside the question of the, of the um, interpretation itself. So um, that, it means really that it's hard to see any objections to the basic question that is posed in, in today's seminar, which is that... Uh, that the, the need uh, that is felt uh, consistently to <coughs> reconfigure, to use other words, to reconfigure the past, to readjust the writing of the, of the past. You might say that the broader the canvas is, the more ambitious the project is, the more it is open to revision. So if you write a very narrow piece, it's less likely to be open to much revision than um, a broad-ranging history of the world from, uh, from ever to ever. Um, and um, you know, I, I, Daniel Trent, in, in his introduction to, I don't know whether it went to everybody, but it went to me anyway, uh, but the, the introduction to this seminar, he, he, he posed the question about whether any work of historical research can be definitive, can ever be definitive. Well, I think my history of the, <laughs> of the um, economy of Bolton Priory between 1226 and 1325. <laughs> uh, it's hard to see any major revision anyway. Um, 
and, uh, and of course, we, we see that uh, historical research, amongst other things, is pushed by simple historical inquiry, uh, whether that has a direct relationship to the present or not. Um, it may again vary from, from the mind the perspective of what's going on. But I, I have in mind, when I finish this history of the uh, Europe of the and we're going up into our present day, there's two volume history of Europe in the 20th century, and we'll go into our end up of it in the present. I, my big ambition is to turn back to something which I was um, writing as a student at Oxford in the 1960s, and that was a piece of historical revisionism because there'd been an article published in the English Historical Review in 1938 by a medieval historian called T.A.M. Bishop, and it was on monastic granges in Yorkshire. And in that, the bishop got the, the granges of the Augustinian canons completely wrong. And it's been my ambition ever since to write this article to demonstrate that. And my big ambition, attached to that ambition, is that it, this will be read by probably three people. <laughs> <laughs> my wife and myself and then <laughs> but, um, so, uh, so, But um, it, it's obvious then that, that history is subject to um, the rise of history subject to continuous adjustment to, uh, to revision, you might say. And as I said, I find it hard to see any objections to that general notion. But I will raise three questions with you, which uh, flow in a way from the subtitle of the in part from the subtitle. The first of these, uh, picking up the point that Felipe made right at the end of his, of his wonderful talk there, which is, has the tempo of revisionism intensified? <laughs> uh, it almost certainly has. I think if you look back to the beginning of the 20th century, or the late 19th century, the first was not there as frequently as it is today to produce this constant revisionism of historical writing. Of course, there was some, but I think the tempo has increased. So if it has increased, why is this? Um, is it through the supply? Or through the demand, do we actually demand more revision of the past, or is it that there's more um, input given by outside forces then to, to more or less compel us to accept revision of the past? Or maybe it's both. But in the, in the case of the supply side of this, we have of course now a great media interest in the past. We only got to think back to 1914 and the interest that was created, not just there, but created by the media interest in the, origin, in the origins of the First World War. Inundated with it, so of course that brings about the need for a sort of revision. But much of this is produced by, uh, by uh, newspapers, by newspapers, but also especially I would think these days by television. And uh, you know, I did some work some years ago with the, with the BBC, and they were of course always running programs about reputations and the adjustments you take some famous person and then you would have to debunk the reputation of that person. So there's this sort of thing which goes on, on the one hand from the media interest in, in, uh, in history. Secondly, um, history is business. We know for publishers want to sell books and they, as they come round and ask you, will you write, consider writing a book on this? And then it doesn't matter that a book has been written on it 20 years or 30 years. They think, well, maybe this time, time has come for another one. And uh, so that then means that they're looking for a new angle. Uh, when I wrote this, the, the Hitler volumes, which were very kindly referred to by Daniel, um, I didn't select that as a topic. I was approached by Penguin, who said, we think the time has come to write a, another a Hitler biography. And um, actually, I said no initially. I said, no, I don't think so. And uh, I'm not very interested in doing so anyway. And then I reread the older books by, um, by Alan Bullock, written in 1952, brilliant at this time. And then later on, the, the big German uh, bi uh, biography by Jürgen Fest, published in 1973. And having read them, I thought, hmm, I think I could be better than that. <laughs> and um, so the, the revision, revision of them came in the first instance from, from um, Penguin, from the publisher. And then it came, of course, from my own type of personal ambition, I suppose. And then uh, also, as has as been said again, already, um, we have history as mass education. We have now the, the uh, as Felipe was saying, you appoint somebody to, uh, to a, a young uh, scholar to a post in the university, and you expect that person then to be pushing the boat out or revising what's gone on before, to coming up with new interpretations. And the very process of education is pushing this along. So even at the very base level, 
we have, uh, when I left Sheffield, I think we had about 300 people, 300 undergraduates each year, and most of those were writing an undergraduate dissertation. Even at that level, you're trying to get somebody to do something new, to try to tackle some issue, broad issue, and then say, let's take a little corner of that and, and attempt to find some new angle or write something new. Uh, of course, uh, a selection of these people then go on to do PhDs, and a PhD level is more like much more advanced level. You're actually looking for a form of revisions. And from there on, of course, some others go on to write books about it. So, um, history as, uh, as mass education, the number of historians that have been produced, when you compare that with the United States, that's the number of historians that have been produced. Some of them are sucked into television or radio, mea culpa, and um, or write, write, um, write books for, uh, for what's called trade press. Um, so, all, in all these ways, then, history has been constantly revised and revisited, and things which are very well known are being addressed um, anew. Um, <coughs> and uh, so, um, one, one thing is, I think, the speed and the tempo of, of, of and the dramatic nature of recent change in the world does demand ever more of this rethinking of the past. Second question, really, is, is revision of the past invariably a response to generational need? That's implied in the question, in the, in the subtitle to our question tonight. Is it invariably uh, a response to generational need? I don't want to go into the whole question of generation. It's a very complicated uh, concept here, dealt with by Karl Mann in 1928, I think it was, but very complicated uh, concept. Well, let's leave that one so I just deal with the common sense of it. Well, sometimes it plainly is a response to generational need. I think here of one example, for example, West Germany in the 1960s and the way in which the, the West German population there, and in particular the younger generation of West Germans, felt the need to challenge the, um, the collective amnesia of their parents' generation in dealing with the, the Nazi past. And in the 1960s, then, for the first time, this completely new type of uh, his history being attempted there in Germany, which was overthrowing the, the way in which the conservative historians up to then had dealt with it. The new history was, was very influenced by Marxism, and in turn, that's being revised subsequently. But that's just an example of the way in which the, ge the generational revolt then led into, of course, the student demonstrations mm -hmm. in 1968 in, in West Germany, but also in other parts of, of Europe. Um, we're getting to the end, okay. Um, uh, but um, some major revisionism, however, doesn't come from generational change or the need for generational, for each generation to revise its past, but actually simply from the scale of dramatic political change. To take, give you this two obvious examples of 1945 and the, the end of, of Nazism and fascism. Uh, the rewriting of, the, of history that needed to be taken, that needs to take place there, and then after 1990 and the end of the Soviet regime. Third, um, third question, very briefly, is the um, need for revision of the past greater where the drama and historical <coughs> discontinuities are greater? I would think it is. So if we look at our own country now, the point about imperialism, you mentioned how we look at greatly differently on imperialism now to what we used to do 20, 30 years ago, let alone, let alone before the Second World War. Um, but even so, in this country, there's been a sort of gradual change in the revision of the past. When I look at Germany, which is a country I've um, worked mainly on, of course, there you see the changes, the, the political changes have been dramatic in different phases, and the writing of history, Weimar Republic, Nazi Germany, post-war West Germany, post-war East Germany, post-East uh, post German writing of history. So the, the transformation of writing of history there has been absolutely profound. And the adjustments have been partly generational, partly turned up by these uh, historical discontinuities. So I think there's a case there of saying that uh, regime change is one big element of that. I haven't got time now to go into the, the question of writing of uh, writing about the Holocaust, but there too you see very plain demonstration of major changes in the way, partly generational, partly through the political events and the way in which Germany has uh, related to the Holocaust. One last um, point, and again, picking up on what other previous speakers said, is there such a thing 
as historical reality. This was a question which Daniel posed in his introductory work. I would say yes, there is. Um, we'll go into the very uh, the philosophical question about what is objectivity. But there is. The historian is not free to create the past according to his or her own likes, but is bound by certain rules of evidence, even if the regular rules of evidence are subject to different interpretation. So, um, going back to a point that uh, Penny was um, making at the start, well, I'll just to preface that, say, the historian of, let's say, the novelists um, have different parameters here. Uh, Wolf Hall can be written with a freedom, but the historian of Tudor England cannot really use. Uh, but uh, the point that um, Penny was making right at the beginning, I think, that revision is not actually erasure, that we build upon the past, we build upon what is already a, a deal written about. So you don't go back to a, a tabula rasa, we don't have a tabula rasa and begin from, from fresh. So it is a building process, and to stay with the, the, um, the scaffold notion, uh, I think it's right that the, the, the facts, banal as they are, are just the, are just the bricks, the stones on, out of which the building is created. And you can formulate, you can put the bricks in different forms, you can put them in a different building. And in a way, that is like the writing of history, that you have certain things which are not changed, changeable in themselves, but they are in themselves fairly banal, like a brick is banal. But the building that comes out of them, a collection of bricks, but in different <coughs> ways, is sometimes not banal. Sometimes it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Jonathan Steinberg. I'm going to why you up, Jonathan. <laughs> I tested this at home, and in order to stick to 10 minutes, I'm going to do it, I suppose, by bullet points or propositions. And I hope these propositions hang together, they convince me, or they convince me <laughs> the generation. I would also like to thank Daniel Snowman and uh, the absent Lawrence Goldman for organizing these seminars, and all of you coming to listen to them. So here you are, point one. History is the study of the human past, but that past no longer exists. Two, history is not the past, but a form of systematic thinking about the past. Three, when we think about the past, we confront evidence, mostly verbal, but occasionally statistical or material relics of the actions of human beings like ourselves. With the exception of the counting side of it, demog demography or economic history, most of what we do as human beings is to read what other human beings have written. And our knowledge of what we get from that rests on human qualities because our objects of study are also subjects like ourselves. Which means that we use, and this is extremely controversial, people don't like this, we use a form of knowledge which I call human knowledge which is the knowledge that all of us have in our human relations, what a doctor has with a patient, what you have when you get a telephone call from a relative and you know she's angry, all those things. Four, the interac interaction of subject and object produces a special form of knowing common to all the human sciences, which is a mix of fact, analysis, and intuition. Now, the historian starts with herself. She can only observe those bits of evidence from a past now irretrievably lost from her vantage point. Person born in a particular year, speaking a particular language, having a particular ethnic identity, a temperament, life experience, family, education. In other words, this is my fifth point, all history starts with itself. Now at this point, one despairs because the inescapable conclu uh, conclusion from the fact that we living subjects study subjects the dead would appear to be that no secure knowledge can be obtained. History must be no more than an utterly random and entirely subjective clash of unfounded assertions, which is all for to be. I think the answer to that is that the solution does not lie in ourselves, but in the rules and procedures that govern the intersubjective exchange. Each of us observes certain rules, and that's been mentioned by previous speakers. 
assertions must be supported with evidence. We ought not to imagine what the characters of the past thought unless we have some evidence. No plagiarism. We must carry out a literature search to place our work in the context of previous research. We must try to give precise dates and places for the events we describe. As we observe such rules, we hope and are fairly certain that others do too. Eight, we submit our work to public scrutiny and others read, approve, disapprove, correct, augment, or ad adapt our contributions. Nine, this dialogue among practitioners produces a new consensus. It could be compared to a market of ideas in which competing claims like goods in the free market arrive at an equilibrium price, so to speak, where supply and demand are just set. The interchange of our subjectivities produces a general consensus about what happened in a particular part of the past. It's not objective. In absolute terms, it creates a certain kind of objectivity of result. I'm not objective, you're not objective. But the system, by forcing us to confront each other, to read other people's work, to think about what they do and say, the interchange of ideas in the historical marketplace may not create objectivity, but it creates a certain impersonality <coughs> which matters, and we call that <coughs> Moreover, this is 10, knowledge, I'm going to do it. Knowledge from the past <laughs> gradually accumulates as the present becomes past and forms an objective, so to speak, coagulation. Karl Popper called in the wonderful age, it's the beehive after the bees have gone. Libraries are full of them. The contents of libraries, the absorption of the national culture, the prevailing myths about the history of the community add to that coagulated knowledge. Each of us acquires a version of this type of knowledge in school and so on. Now, I come to the I think, point which bothers me most. To do this effectively as historians, each of us must build a mental mo model of the subject and correct it as he or she works her way into the subject. And that requires <coughs> of memory. The historian acquires a kind of mental library of sources that matter and events or characters, or issues, like the causes of the First World War, or the emergence of Stalin, or the revolution of 1848. And I was thinking, since I got this invitation, what I'm working on at any given moment. I'm reading a, a very remarkable book. I don't talk about it because it's not yet been published. Very remarkable, 700 pages of it. And as I read it, the author says something, and I think, that can't be right, because and I do this so habitually, measured against what I remember, that is, in a sense, a historical test. That can't be right, that's not the right word, that's not the right thing, that's not the right interpretation. And that pops into my head. But it pops into my head because there's a model there which I work from. Now, if that makes sense to me as a practitioner, and it does, it seems to me that we can relax. Because what's happening is a process which is inevitable since we all start with ourselves, our time, our generations, the questions that we ask of our age, we're bound to be in a position where we're looking for new issues. Now, there are two things that occur to me when I will stop, right, that you actually determine. First is, what happens if people don't remember anything? And that seems to be my experience with undergraduates now. They've lost the capacity to memorize. They don't have these models. You have to start from scratch all the time. And the second is, um, what happens when I'm not so good at remembering things anymore? <laughs> and some of you in this room will know what that problem is. <laughs> so I'll stop at this point. I have another issue, but I, I won't raise it because I want to stick to 10 minutes. Thank you.